I am Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. All right. What's up, everyone? This is Jimbo Paris. Welcome again to the Jimbo Paris Show. And today we have a very special guest, Tommy Breedlove. He is the author of the book Legendary, and I've got a lot of great questions to ask him. Glad to be here. Right. Unfortunately, I'm in the middle of a construction zone, so hopefully the sound is okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, the lighting, you seem to have a very excellent setup. <laughs> it's temporary. I wish you could see behind the scenes. You got the lighting, got the microphone, got all of the screens, but I am literally, hopefully it won't be too loud, t- t- five, ten feet from massive construction. So I'm in the middle of a major renovation, but hey, man, hey, let's. this is all real and live, brother. Let's go. <laughs> Sounds good. So let's get started. Again, this show is all about you. Can you kind of tell me what you specifically do? So I'm the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author of the book Legendary. And I've built an entire movement around the principles of Legendary. We're not for everybody. We're more for the ambitious driven types. Think entrepreneurs, people who want to be successful, not only in business and money, but in life. And so the entire movement consists of treats, adventure experiences, but also masterminds in a community. So we want to be the family that you choose to do business in life with. And so uh, legendary is all about building and living a legendary life, not just money, not just success, but reconquering our time, living with purpose, living the good life, building a world-class network, but more importantly, being courageous in life, mastering your mindset, uh, having more intimate relationship with family and friends. So we've built an entire movement, retreats, experiences, masterminds, everything around the movement, and it's growing like a weed. Again, we're not for everybody, but I'm super thankful to be doing, uh, working in my purpose and do what I love doing for a living, man. So I've got two big questions from what you just said there. So the first one is, how long have you been in this industry? And then the second question is, how did you build a legendary life for yourself? I'll answer question two first, is I work every single day on building a legendary life for myself. And what I love about legendary is it's an aspirational word. If Tommy Breedlove says he's legendary, I would laugh myself out of the room. But what I love about the word legendary is it's given to us by our peers, our community, organizations, those we serve and all around us. And we can either be unbelievable legends or bad legends. And for me, I want to leave the people I touch in this world a little bit better than I found it. So that to me is what building and living a legendary life is. So I've been in this industry in and around about eight years now. I spent 20 plus years in large financial consulting, mergers and acquisition, public accounting firms. I was a senior partner, owner, international practice leader. And I went through a massive life transformation. I was very successful business and money wise because that's what I was trained to do. It's cool that I'm actually standing literally in a live construction zone. But with that being said, you know, I thought money, success, power and status would make me happy and light me up. And all those things are super important, but they're a magnifying glass. If you're a miserable, judgmental, gossipy, angry, rageful, fearful based person, it's going to magnify that. And that's what I was. Or if you're a loving, abundant, giving, serving, happy, peaceful, patient person, it's going to magnify that. And when I got to the top of the game and I noticed the money, the power of success didn't light me up, I turned to all of the dark side. I'm talking like the Wolf of Wall Street lifestyle. And so from that moment on, man, I said, you know what? I'm going to make me my full-time job. My mental muscles, my emotional muscles, my physical muscles, my spiritual muscles, while maintaining my ambition and drive. And so, you know, I was at the top of the financial game. I'd been elected to the board of directors. I was an owner of a large, big firm. And all of my network started reaching out to me, man. And I thought they wanted to do business or transactions, but turned out they wanted to go for a walk or grab a beer or some coffee or breakfast. And literally every single one of them were like, hey, man, what did you do? Because I want some of that. They saw my income double. They saw my network 10X, but they also saw a calmness in me, a humility in me. I was present, courageous, and confident, but all in the humble ways. But they also saw my marriage go from life support to strength. And so all of these executives, entrepreneurs, bankers, lawyers, private equity people are like, hey, man, what did you do? And I want some of that. And eventually they said, well, you need to write a book telling people how to do this. And I did. And what I love about Legendary, and by the way, if you're not a reader, I will read it to you um, on Audible. But what I love about it, it's not only fun and quick, but it's actionable. Do you want more time? Do you want more purpose? Do you want more money? Do you want more uh, master your mindset? Do you want to be in charge of your emotions? Do you want more friendships or better network? It's actionable. And so when I wrote the book, it did really, really well. 
And then from there, I was like, okay, I'll sell my equity in the firm, go chase a dream, go chase this entrepreneurial dream. Uh, it started as a one-on-one -on -one coaching practice. We do not do much of, uh, more on that, but now it's turned into live retreats for men and women uh, who are entrepreneurs and executives. It's turned into adventure and fun experiences throughout the year, and it's also turned into a mastermind and community. And so we couldn't be more thankful. So that's how long I've been doing it. And it just kind of fell in my lap. I never in a million years, 10 years ago, would have said, this is what I'm going to do for a living, Jimbo. Okay. And sort of what was that transformational moment that you personally experienced? Yeah. And it was my second one. So I'll, st I'll start with the first one. At 18 years old, um, I grew up in the South side of Atlanta, good hardworking blue collar part of the world. Think people who fix things or military or warehousing and mechanics. And unfortunately I grew up in and around a lot of violence and abuse. And at 18, I was going to be the first person in my family to go to and graduate from college and actually have a professional career. But unfortunately, I turned to the things I hated. I grew up around violence and abuse, and I became that violence and abuse. So at 18, I committed a violent crime. I was looking at seven years in prison. Luckily, it was dropped to misdemeanors, and it was taken down to two, uh, to two misdemeanors, but I still was sentenced to two years. So I, instead of going to a full ride to all of these universities, I ended up spending my 19th birthday in a cage. Fast forward from there, I really went from a cage to a nuclear waste con container factory, community college at night to university. And then I really, I went from a literally jail to a company called Deloitte, which I think today is the largest financial consulting firm in the world. And thought that, you know, money, power, status, and, and the American dream would fulfill me. And so I just worked harder than everybody. I hustled everybody. I was ye who turns the lights off last guy and was just looking for that affirmation through success, looking for that affirmation through the corner office, looking for that affirmation from the shiny things. And I found all of those things. But what I never dealt with was those insecurities, those fears, and that anger from my childhood. And the second transformation, I literally found myself in a ditch in downtown Atlanta, looking at the blue sky one morning, didn't know how I got there, half dressed, didn't know where my car was after just three days of computer chaos and debauchery. And at that moment, I was like, this is number two, and I don't know if you're going to get number three. So man, instead of wearing all these masks, tough guy, important guy, can't ask for help guy, why don't you just become Tommy? Why don't you just figure out who you are, where you're going to go, and who's coming with you? And I made me, through great coaching, through therapy, through reading everything I can get my hands on, to finally surrounding myself with positive, fun, abundant-minded people, as opposed to negative, fear-based people, which I was one of those. And my whole life just started transforming. And for the last 12 years, I've lived Literally every day made me my full-time job. So I make me my full-time job so I can lead, love, and respect myself first so that I can lead, love, and respect others. And so that was transformation number two. And that's how I fell into all this. And I don't want people to just to be elite and world-class and badass and business and success. That's pretty easy to do if you're just disciplined and work <laughs> every day to grow on that. It's really hard to be elite and world-class, not only in business and success, but in your mindset your relationships and with yourself. And so that's what we're all about, my friend. You raised some really important points because I think even before your change, that lifestyle that you had was what a lot of you know young men would also personally want to, because that's usually what goes through their head. Well, I don't know, but at least with me, you know, it was always money, success, those types of things. And again, you said it, discipline is a big factor, but then there's that human element as well. Yeah. Men love, um, not all men, but most men crave respect, admiration, power, and status, right? And they fear embarrassment, but wherever you go, there you are. So if you're filled up with anger or worried or insecurity, and we all got these thoughts and, and voices in our head that says, Hey, what if they figure out I'm not enough? What are they? I'm not smart enough, good enough, comparing ourselves to someone who's 20 years ahead of us, or I'm not successful enough or skinny enough. We all got it, men and women. And we have to deal with that first. I want people when they look into the mirror and see an ally and not an enemy. And so many of us chase, chase, chase this ideal of more. And when I have this and when I have more of this, I'll be happy. Well, if you're not happy now, that's just going to magnify that unhappy. The whole point of our movement is isolation is the enemy of excellence. You cannot build a legendary business success in life alone. I hope we're the family and community you choose to do with it. Number two is reprioritizing yourself. Get strong. Lead yourself first. Strong mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. And the third thing is, is we believe everybody can be pros in all phases of their lives. They can be happy in all phases of their lives. we got to define what success is, but do it with us. And finally, I believe that no matter what story we tell us or what thoughts we have in our head or that what we see in the mirror, we do the work, 
we unwire it, we change false beliefs, we change the story, rewrite the story. When we look in that mirror, you can see strength, courage, and confidence. And at the end of the day, you can become an ally and not an enemy. That's the hope. And speaking of that hope, what do you hope for others? Can you kind of explain more of this legendary life movement that you've kind of built now? What I'm fighting against is both sides of our media today are telling us we're victims or telling us we're entitled to something. And unfortunately, no one owes us anything. And there's no politician that's going to save us. There's no magic pill. There's no quick fix. We need to look in the mirror and know that's the problem, the solution. So the first thing in a legendary lifestyle is looking in the mirror and know that is the problem and the solution. The second thing of a, a legendary lifestyle is knowing that the only power you truly have in life is your choices. Will you believe what the news tells you? Are you going to be the puppeteer or the puppet? You're going to be the sheep or the lion. <clears throat> and so for me, it's about knowing you have a choice, looking in the mirror and taking personal accountability and knowing, hey, I am in the problem the solution. Third thing to build a legendary life is to know you can't do it alone. It takes a community. We have to be walking with people who want to be successful, who want to be happy, who want to be better in their relationships, who want to be better in their families, but who also are driven to a higher cause. It's again about having a world-class network. It's about living a purposeful life. It's about always taking action and never giving up. We talked about it earlier. Letting, getting the noise out. Our ears and eyes are inundated with noise. Social media, it's poison, poison, poison. Turning that off and taking control and command, being the captain of your ship back on your life. And finally, the most important, and we've talked about it again, mastering our emotions and mindset having more intimate relationships with our friends, family, and network, and having some fun and living the good life. To me, that's what this whole legendary thing, and by the way, this is not what it looks like and sounds like to have it all going on. I walk this walk shoulder to shoulder. I'm not a guru, I'm not a sage on the stage, and I'm not a therapist behind you. I do this stuff every day. I preach it every day. I get to talk in the mirror every day to hopefully be a little bit better than I was yesterday. And that's, so that's what we're about. You know, and when I hear a lot of that, I think a lot of it is just, you know, again, very important virtues. It's taking accountability and taking responsibility for your life. And, you know, I mean this in the most positive way possible, but I've heard this before from other very successful people too. And I might be wrong here, but is that really what you're trying to push here? The taking responsibility and accountability? Yeah, I, I want people to know that the only power they have is choice and no one can hold you accountable. There's no one going to save you and there's no one that owes you anything, but you owe it to yourself. No successful person has any more time than you do. They don't control the outcomes, but they control their choices and habits. And what action will you take today to be a little bit better than you were yesterday? Who will you surround yourself with that's going in the same direction that you want to go with? And how will you be the master of your ship? And how do you stop turning off all the things that are meant to distract you, to upset you, to get you scared? And when are you going to take control of your life, your heart, your mind? And so that my hope, if you want to know my true hope that when people come to their last day on earth, which is what we all have in common, is that they have a heart full of gratitude and no regrets. That's my hope. Now, again, with all these people, speaking of your clients, what are some of the most notable experiences that you've personally had? Man, I it, that's going to be hard because there's literally hundreds of people in our movement and the experiences that we have in retreats. I mean, we've seen just the most successful of men and women who really were their lives were out of control in so many different ways make a choice, ask for help, ask for guidance. And now their marriages and their, their relationship with their family and friend is as strong as their businesses. We strive for wisdom and not advice, full immersion. And we also are curious first and critical second. But the key to this movement is authenticity. I'm not talking about emotional vomiting. I'm talking about true authenticity. And so what we give people in our masterminds, in our community, at our experiences, when we all get together or in our retreat formats, is we give people the gift of going second. They know they're not alone. Whether it's struggles in business, whether it's struggles in money, whether it's struggles in life, or they don't have the friendships they want or the network they want, they don't know where to start, they're stuck. But most importantly, probably the biggest thing that, that experiences in our retreats give people is clarity, crystal clear clarity on who they are where they're going and who they want to come with them. And also crystal clear on here is the action steps, tools, 
simple techniques, daily routines, and habits that you can form to be as strong as you can to, in all phases of your life, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, but also in leadership and in business. We are a holistic approach. We don't want to just make you again, elite in business. Hell, we did that. For, I, I was in that world for 20 years. It's not fun. I see all the scars and the damage that it does to all those people. They give up everything for just one more dollar. When I get here and when I have more of this, I will be happy. Bullshit. You're not happy now. You're not going to be happy then. It's about quality over quantity, quality for themselves, quality for their families, quality of friends. And most of the people I know are going to spend the quantity of time on their business and careers, but prioritizing, reprioritizing, getting crystal clear on who they are and what they stand for and where they're going. That's what we give them the most in our experiences. What do you think personally the usual mistakes a lot of young people make? And what are some of the things that they might actually be doing Correct. What I love about young people is their open mindedness. They're not certain about anything. They're curious. They're stereotyped that they're not hardworking. I just don't think that's true. I think they're distracted. You know, they want everybody to be equal. They want everybody to have the same opportunities. They're more loving. They more care the way they want the earth and the fellow humans to be better. I just love that. I just love that about the younger generations. They seem to have a lot more compassion than empathy and they're not certain about anything, which is beautiful. When we're getting certain on anything is where a lot of the world's problems come from. Challenges is they're distracted. They don't know they're puppets and they don't know they're addicted to all of the technologies. They're the user. It's almost like they're on heroin, man. It's like they're not in charge of their technology. Technology is in charge of them. And at the end of the day, they have the power to turn it off. They just have to know whether or not they can do it or not and go do something more productive with their lives to get stronger. That would be their biggest challenge. You know, you raise a really good point there because, you know, while media is, it's a complex issue because media really is a very powerful asset. But at the same time, you know, the fire that can cook the food can also burn the house down. So how do you think young kids can kind of work around these social media distractions and issues? The first question is they need to ask is, are they in charge of their technology or is their technology in charge of them? Can they turn it off? If they set a phone aside for an hour, do they start shaking? Look at a fire and watch it go. Listen or read a great book. Listen to a great podcast like the Jimbo Paris show. But what I would tell them to do is fill their life with positivity and goodness because most social media, not all, but a lot of social media, a lot of media, a lot of what we watch on TV and a lot of, of things that input in our eyes and ears is poison. And the last thing I would tell young people is to be who they truly are. We are craving authentic connection like I've never seen it before because everything feels fake to us. And if it feels fake, it probably is fake. And so we get tied, caught up in envy and jealousy of everybody's Instagram fabulous or LinkedIn successful bullshit. They're all just struggling like you are. But what we're craving is connectivity. We're craving authenticity. We're craving that we need to know that we're not alone. I'm telling everybody on this podcast, we have insecurities, fears, worries. We're not alone. Everybody's got them. Let's own them. But the cure is, is are you going to ask for help? Are you going to give someone gift of going second by telling them people what you're struggling with and what choices and actions are you going to take to be a little bit better than you were yesterday? Remember, in the mirror is not an enemy. It is an ally. Fire the enemy, hire the ally. You have to take action to go do it. I think also we struggle with instant, 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 instant. And no successful paint or famous person got there overnight. They worked their asses for it. And so remember that I'm just, too. I'm just agreeing with you here too, because in society we have, you know, this whole notion of, you know, the microwave mindset. I need it now. I need it now. You know, weight loss, you know, make money, health, relationships, you know, people just want this instant thing. And the combination of what you said with the distractions too, just make the whole situation a lot more difficult. And I think we could kind of lead this now into the next question is when it comes to pursuing goals, which is more important, skill set or, or mindset? That's a great question. I think it's intention and action. And the only way to build a skill set is action, working the craft. If you want to become confident in anything, you got to do the reps. Equated to like dribbling a basketball. I was a basketball player. You, you can't be a great shooter and learn, unless you learn how to dribble. So mindset is intention. Mindset is knowing that you can do it or rewiring yourself with confidence, courage to know you can do it. 
you'll become more confident, more courageous, the more times you do it, the more times you fail because every failure is a learning. But I think money is a mindset. I think life is a mindset. Are you saying, uh, I can't afford it or how can I afford it? Are you, are you think money's out there or money's available for you? Do you think that only the lucky get there or do you believe you can create your own luck? And if you're struggling with that, no matter how many skills or how many reps that you take, you're going to be unhappy and insecure and worried or fearful or still so it needs to be both because we see so many confident people in their crafts have an integrity breach, take their own life, depressed, do really stupid things. We see it all the time in business. We see it all the time in entertainment, athletics, the people that we aspire to be. What there are is really confident in their work because they've done the reps and developed the skills, but they don't have the mindset intentions and they're they're still stuck in some story that they're telling themselves and they self-sabotage is really what they're doing. Um, confidence is both working your craft and becoming really good at your craft by doing the reps, but confidence is also working on your heart and mind muscles rewiring the stories you say, rewiring from fear to abundance, rewiring to gratitude, rewiring to not constantly thinking about the next thing, but being present where you are. And there's all tools, systems, actions, processes, and habits to get you there. I think it's a yin and the yang. I think it's the <laughs> rainbow and the storm. I think you have to have both. I mean, I really do. Otherwise you can be really confident in your craft and really get to the top of the game Look at both of our past two presidents, but they seem to be lacking a little bit of self-esteem, grace, presence, peace, and uh, some self-confidence. True, humble yeah. self-confidence. There's a humble. difference between arrogance, which is insecurity on steroids, and humble self-confidence. They're very different things. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Did uh, basketball or your career in basketball ever instill any values in your whole legendary mindset? I think what it did give me is the desire to win the competitiveness. I think we all have earned equality. Like we're all equal in our heart. We all need the same rights. We all need the same opportunities. We all need to be free, safe, seen, heard, loved, and valued. But to say everybody's equal in business, life, sport, art, there's nothing good about giving somebody an eighth place trophy because that's just not life. That's just not. And so for me, I love competition. I love competing. I actually love to lose because then I'm like, you get big on yourself and you think, well, I'm unbeatable. And then someone stomps on you. You're like, okay, there's a lot. There's always someone better. There's always something to learn here. There's always something to grow and there's always something to work on. And I'm a big fan. If you're not growing, you're dying. And so that's why I love sport or art or other things so much. I'm actually allergic to apathy and laziness. I've never been apathetic, not caring or lazy in my life. And I think sport put that in. There. I kind of want to know now, what are sort of your career influences? Who coaches the coach right here? Yeah. So I'm always, always looking for the next coach. I, I usually work with a coach for one to three years and sometimes longer. I worked with my first coach, Nancy Vito. I call her St. Nancy. I worked with her for about four or five years and she helped me with the tools and systems and uh, confidence to leave a really high paying career when I was a partner at a big firm to go chase a dream. It was her the unconditional support of my wife, but also my friends and family say, hey, go chase this dream because I, I really did want to look back with no regrets. But right now I'm working with two coaches, one on the sales and marketing side and one on the vision side. I'm one that practices what I preach. I'm not saying I'm always successful, but I'm very consistent on getting up and doing everything I teach. I'm also involved in two masterminds. I run an executive and entrepreneur women's mastermind and executive entrepreneur men's mastermind in an entire community. And guess what? I'm in two masterminds right now. One is designed for coaches and the other is designed for business. But I'm also really dogmatic about who I surround myself with. I have three rules. One is, do they make me happy? That's question one. Or do they make me better? And usually the people that make me better don't make me happy. <laughs> and three, are they net givers? Are they just constantly taking from me, taking from me, taking from me? Or are they also given? Is it a quid pro quo? Right now, I'm working with a guy named John Mitchell. I'll get some street props. I'm working with a guy named Darren Hardy. I'm working with Evans Putman. I'm in the grade eight mastermind and I'm in the world's best mastermind. So we'll give them a shout out of the people that I'm working with right now. And this uh, first mentor you had... What do you think she saw in you? She wasn't my first mentor. She was my first coach. So I paid first her. Coach. 
Okay. So I'm a firm believer that mentors will appear in your life when you start changing your energy flow, when you start doing the work, when you start reading more and getting more into gratitude and you start really working on yourself to be more courageous and confident and joyful. Great mentors will appear in your life. It's amazing to me how many have appeared in my life. But I also believe if you look at the elites in business, if you look at the elites in athletics, you look at the elites in art, they all have several things in college. So when I look around at the people that I aspire to be, I see that they all have coaches. They're all in masterminds. They're all reading a lot. They're all practicing gratitude. Like if you ask Oprah Winfrey, what's the number one thing that changed her life? It was gratitude. I mean, even the greats of the greats of the greats have coaches, they have mentors, they have groups, and they're surrounding themselves with people that make them better, who are net givers and make them happy. So I'm, I'm actually working, if I think about it, I'm working with three coaches and two masterminds, and I run an entire community and mastermind program and retreats and experiences. I want to take what I learn and take it into my community. I want to take what I learn and take it into my family. So I'm always sharpening the pencil to be a little bit happier and a little bit better. Now, concerning your books, can you tell us more about the first book you wrote, Legendary, and maybe some of the services you offer on your website? I'll talk about Legendary. It's at all your favorite bookstores. Super thankful that it's a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller. You can find it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Hardback, Softback, Electronic, or on Audible. Again, if you're not a reader, I will read it to you. What I love about Legendary is it's simple, it's fast, but more importantly, it's executable. What I recommend to people is that read it or listen to it through once and then go back and work the area that you need the most. Is it more money? Is it more success? Is it more time, better relationships, a better network, being the master of your emotions, being the master of your mindset? Is it cutting out the noise? Is it living the good life? Go where you need to go and work that and work it hard. So listen or read Legendary. That's the first thing. If you're interested in one of our masterminds, our community, our retreats, our experiences, you can go onto our TommyBreedLove.com. You're on it right now. There it is. It tells you about everything. Retreats, mastermind, community. There's not much about the experiences. We don't really offer the experiences to the public. So if you want to join one of our outdoor or adventures or anything like that, you're going to have to join our community, our mastermind, and then you'll get the the fun invite to our adventures, our outdoor stuff, our challenges, our sport, our art, our uh, learning experiences to go have some fun and connect with us. It's all right there on TommyBreedLove.com. And I know I've been hammering social media, but if you go to our social media, it's all about business, money, success, mindset, all that good stuff. So check us out there as well. It's all here on TommyBreedLove.com. There's the book. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> you know, this has been an amazing interview. You Gave some great answers here. Um, you had a good energy. I liked it. Jimbo, I'm grateful for you, man. You're very welcome. Anytime. Are there any final words you would like to give to the audience? Yeah, I will, I'll close it out with this. Is You must participate in your own rescue. Again, no one owes you anything. They have their own self-interest. And that's just, that, that's just human nature. It's what keeps us alive. But you mm -hmm. must participate in your own rescue. You must take small actions each day in the area that you're struggling with the most to be a little bit better than you were yesterday. You must hold yourself personally accountable. You must join a community of people going in the same direction you're going in or who inspire you or who want to make you better. Isolation is the enemy of excellence. You cannot build and live a legendary life or business alone. Get in a community, surround yourself with great people, participate in your own rescue, and know that one day when you look in the mirror, you will see an ally and not an enemy and something that you're truly, truly proud of. And that's my hope. But you must Make the choice to participate in your own rescue. All right. Excellent talk, sir. Yeah, you're very Enjoyed welcome, it. Jimbo. You're very welcome. Thank you, my friend. Just a few quick shout outs here. First one is Lifework Systems by Judy Ryan. She's an HR superstar and she works hard to kind of help large corporate businesses improve their business infrastructure. And then the next thing is our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe now to us. We're growing still and ring that bell. Let us know. Thank you. And then the next thing is our Roku channel. And this is kind of what we use a lot. All of our episodes are on Roku. Just get a Roku box and you can look at the show. This will be on Roku as well as all of our other episodes. And the final thing, Jimbo Parish services. And essentially with services, I will go into your business and I will help build things for you. I will help market content and I will help build content for you. We've already worked with GE, General Electric, one of the largest corporate businesses in the world. And we've helped build content for them to help them their market, their um, scientists, their engineers, and so forth. If you're interested in that, 
let me know. I'm Jimbo Paris. This is the Jimbo Paris Show. Thank you for listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. 